everyone and welcome to Wovar Wellness Systems first uh, mini webinar uh, on, um, on health mm -hmm. and today our topic is going to be digestion where we're going to cover basic digestion principles and hopefully give you some useful information that will help change the way you look at food and also the way you look at digestion and some of the things that we do that can sabotage digestion and and um, and um, <clears throat> uh, interfere with the absorption of vitamins minerals and nutrients okay so let's get started first of all let me ask you a question um, why do we eat Why do we eat in the first place? Uh, we eat to uh, take in nutrients. We eat to refuel our body, to bring energy into our body. Um, I want you to think about, um, as far as the variety of foods that we eat as well, um, and how they affect different organs and tissues in your body. For example, most people would say, okay, if I eat certain things, like what would be good for my bones? What types of things, would, what types of minerals would be useful for my bones? They always tell you dairy products. Well, you say we need, our bones need calcium. Our bones need phosphorus. Uh, somebody showed me the other day, they brought in a supplement that said boron for bones. Well, yeah, boron's important for bones. Um, and so how does calcium, phosphorus, boron, and, and other minerals get into your bones when you eat. Okay, how does it know to go to your bones and not to uh, other tissues? How do, for example, what about eyes? Somebody brought in an eye formula the other day. So what, what's good for my eyes? And they brought in a, a formula that they had um, um, bilberry, vitamin A, vitamin C, zinc. How do those things know to go to your eyes? What about pancreas, pancreatic enzymes? You need B vitamins, you need zinc. Um, you need chromium to activate your insulin. How do things know to go there? Well, they just know. Okay, that's the beauty of the whole system. We don't have to think about eating something and saying, here, I want you to get calcium, I want you to go to my bones, I want you, uh, vitamin A to go to my eyes, and iron to go to my liver, and go to my blood cells. Your body just knows where to send things. And I always use the metaphor of the um, uh, luggage carousel at the airport. When you go to baggage claim to get your stuff, everybody's standing around waiting for the buzzer to go off and for the, yeah, the baggage start coming down the chute and around the carousel. And everybody's standing around and you're waiting and say, okay, uh, there's mine. And you grab your one bag and then you're waiting and then you grab your other bag. And that's kind of how it works when you're digesting. As blood, as the nutrients are absorbed into your bloodstream and they circulate through the body, the different organs just have an electromagnetic attraction to certain vitamins and minerals and elements where they grab them and pull them into those tissues. What happens though at the baggage carousel, if for some terrible reason, your bags got lost, or your bags got misplaced, or your bags got sent to another airport. And you're standing there waiting for your stuff, and it's not coming, and not coming, and not coming. And then the carousel stops, and you're hit with the realization that your stuff didn't make it, and you're not getting your stuff. So what do you do? Uh, well, you go file a claim or whatever. But what does your body do? What do your bones do when they're waiting for their calcium and it's not coming? And when in your blood cells, your red blood cells in your uh, liver is waiting for your iron and it doesn't come. And on and on, your vitamin A, it does not get to your eyes because you're not eating carrots and dark green vegetables and good oils. So what happens to those tissue? What happens if, they don't, if you don't feed them again tomorrow? And then the next day, and then the next day, and the next day. This is how diseases are built. Diseases don't just happen because of bad luck. They happen because of bad planning and bad health practices. So if we want to improve our health, we have to start improving our habits. 
and start changing the way we look at food and thinking, well, do we eat just to have something taste good in our mouth for five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes at a restaurant or to, to nourish our body? And, and can you have it both ways? Actually, I think you can. I think you can have good food that tastes good but also nourishes your body. So we're gonna start uh, now and we're gonna start with um, uh, where does digestion begin? Well, it actually begins right here in your mouth. Your salivary glands in your cheek, they begin the digestive process by uh, the starting the digestion of starches. So, but let's go back a step. What is your digestive system? Well, guess what? It's actually just a big juicer. How many of you out there juice? Yeah, I do. I love juicing. And I've been juicing for years. I have every juicer ever created by mankind. And uh, if you think about it, your digestive system, for the most part, takes solids and converts them to liquids. I mean, can you absorb through your small intestine? Can you absorb a piece of steak? Can you absorb spaghetti? Can you absorb bread or fruit? No, what you have to first do is liquefy and to create to turn a solid into a liquid. So very simply, where does that process begin? It begins in your mouth and that's kind of why you have these things here, these things called teeth. Teeth mash and masticate and break up food. And then as we chew, we start the process of liquefying mixing our food with enzymes in your mouth, but also liquefying your food. I know this is kind of gross, but um, I don't, I'm not totally ad adverse to gross stories, but one time in 39 years in practice, somebody actually threw up on me. And um, it was at the end of the morning, and the lady said she was feeling very sick and very nauseous, and that she had felt sick since a picnic the day before. This was obviously in the summertime. And she said, I, I said, what did you eat at the picnic? And she said, oh, I, I had a hot dog and I had some peanuts and everything. And I just didn't feel good, you know, after that. And I didn't eat much more. And so I'm going, okay. And she goes, oh, no, dog, and I feel really nauseous. And I feel really, and I said, oh, you're fine. Let me check you. And I'm like checking myself. Oh, yeah, your gallbladder's, your gallbladder's out. Yeah, for sure. You got, you got some gallbladder issues. We'll probably have to give you some bowel salts or something for that. And she's like, Doc, I really don't feel good. I said, you're fine, let me work on this. I'm, Doc, I really don't feel good. <laughs> and I, I, I said, well, you feel like, uh, too late. She sat up and bleh, all over me, right over my chest, down my shirt. And guess what she threw up on me 24 hours after the picnic? The hot dog. Chunks of hot dog and peanuts. I was literally like one, do you chew your food? Do you, you know, that's the first thing I had thought of. I'm like, this, this stuff hasn't even been chewed. It was chunks of peanut and hot dogs. And it, her stomach didn't let, let go of it because your stomach won't release until something's been chewed, you know, masticated, chewed up, turned into liquefied, liquefied and turned into chyme, like a, a semi-solid liquid before it let go. And, we, and it was trying to, and I was like, oh, dogs do that. I mean, dogs like chew things and the swallow the moles and then swallow it. But humans are supposed to chew their food till it's liquid. So the simple rule here is chew your solids. I mean, chew your solids till they're liquid and chew your liquids as though they were solid. So you still should salivate, even if you're juicing, you should you mix your, your juice with your saliva to begin the process of carbohydrate digestion. So that's number one, mouth, Starch digestion begins and we break down big chunks of food and we liquefy them and send them down into the stomach. Now things start to get interesting here. So let's go to the stomach and draw your stomach right here. There's your esophagus and your stomach kind of looks a little bit like that. And what happens in the stomach? Okay, first of all, if you watch all the commercials on TV, we know that there's obviously has to be enzymes in our stomach, but there's also acid in the stomach. Now, question for the class here. Stomach acid, if you were going to be only go by what you were taught on television, 
Is stomach acid good or bad? Bad. Bad. <clears throat> yeah, because we got all kind of neat things from plop, plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is, to Pepto-Bismol, which comes down and coats the stomach with that nice clear pink stuff, and uh, all the other things. The firemen sliding down the pole, you know, to put out the fire, well, that's Nexium, and then we have Prilus, Xantec, Tagamet, um, Protonics, you name it, all the acid blocker drugs that you see advertised on TV. Now, if you're very astute and you stick around and watch the next commercial, it's probably the one for the law firm asking you if anybody in your family has taken all those wonderful drugs and now has kidney problems or heart problems and whatever. And if they do, contact their law office and they'll help get money for you. Okay, <laughs> so for being foolish enough to take those, yeah, take those drugs. So let's go back and say, well, um, how digestion actually occurs. Okay, you have in your stomach, in your stomach cells lining here that secrete hydrogen which is a positive charge, and that's called a proton, okay? Hence, the, uh, the drug protonix. Take a guess what protonix does to the proton. If you said it nixes the proton, you're absolutely correct, and we'll get back to that in a minute. But hydrogen's positive charge, chloride's negative charge. These two guys come together and they form hydrochloric acid, HCl. So we get that and we get rid of this. And what does hydrochloric acid do? Actually, it serves two functions. One, it kills bacteria. So it nixes the bacteria that can come into our bodies through our mouth. So we kill bacteria. And two, we activate our main stomach enzyme, which is pepsin. So we increase or we activate pepsin. Pepsin though is secreted in the stomach, as most enzymes are, in an inactive form called pepsinogen. And a lot of enzymes are also trypsin is trypsinogen and chymotrypsin, chy chymotrypsinogen. They're secreted in an inactive form, and then something activates or turns them on, okay? And in this case, it happens to be hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid activates pepsin. It changes, it alters the molecule. It actually reduces it from a big molecule of a high molecular weight to a smaller molecule, pepsin. And what does pepsin do? Pepsin digests protein. It takes big molecules of protein and it cuts them in half to medium-sized molecules of protein. So, uh, if we nix the proton and we get rid of the hydrogen, we cannot make hydrochloric acid. And if we can't make hydrochloric acid, we cannot make pepsin. And so what do we have in our stomach to digest our food? Actually, nothing useful at that point to digest our food. So I wanted to just show you quickly and isn't. So you don't, you don't have to believe me when I tell you this. This is Dr. Guyton. This is the medical Bible that all, all health professionals study in medical school. And it's physiology. Physiology is how your body functions. I'm just going to read. It's like one uh, short, tiny, three-sentence paragraph. Okay. It says, when pepsinogen is first secreted, it has no digestive activity. However, as soon as it comes in contact with hydrochloric acid, it is activated to form active pepsin. In this process, the pepsinogen molecule having a molecular weight of 42,500 is split to form a pepsin molecule having a molecular weight of 35,000. Pepsin functions as an active proteolytic enzyme, which means proteolysis is to digest or break apart protein. So it's a protein digesting enzyme in a highly acid medium, optimally a pH of 1.8 to 3.5. But above a pH of about five, it has almost no proteolytic activity and becomes completely inactivated in a very short time. 
Hydrochloric acid is as necessary as pepsin for protein digestion in the stomach. I think that's pretty clear that hydrochloric acid is extremely important. So that if we neutralize hydrochloric acid through a variety of means, one through these medications, and second, through a very common practice that most people in the, in the United States anyway, do in their eating, we don't digest protein. So what might that process be? What is the custom, customary thing that we do in the United States that could weaken our stomach acid? So let's go back real quick. We have our pH scale that goes from one to 14. 7.0 is neutral, so when you buy your shampoo that's pH balanced, what is the pH? Seven, it's neutral. It's neither acid, acid is less than seven, and alkaline or base is greater than seven. Okay, so the further you go towards one, the more acidic something is, and the further you go to 14, the more alkaline something is, and both extremes will burn you. Lye has a pH of about 12, and that's what they use to wash clothes with, and lye will burn your skin. But so will hydrochloric acid, a pH of less than 2, like 1.8. Well, we said it's optimal 1.8, so this is 1 to 1.8 to 3.5, somewhere here. 1.8, 3.5 is optimal pH for the stomach to function. At a pH of 5.0 or greater, hydrochloric, I mean, uh, the activity of pepsin goes to zero, completely inactivated. So to me, zero pretty much means zero, it means nothing. So if we're, our purpose of our stomach is to take big molecules of protein and break them in half so that when they're ready to leave the stomach, they're smaller molecules of protein. They're now ready for the next phase of digestion in the small intestine. But if we don't allow this to happen, what we're gonna get down here are these big molecules of protein. And unfortunately, when things move on to the next phase of digestion, the small intestine enzymes coming from the pancreas are not able to digest big molecules of protein. They were designed to take these medium-sized molecules of protein and then finish them up like the chef with the Ginzu knife and go, you know, like you're doing cutting up carrots and onions and things on your, on your, um, your cutting, um, cutting, board. cutting board. Yeah, so we have to get in the stomach, we have to prep our food for the next phase of digestion. So what, what is the common practice that we do when you're out to eat that could also weaken your stomach acid other than taking a medication or a drug? Water. 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 What happens when you go to the restaurant and your waiter comes up and says, Hello, my name is Jean. I will be your waiter today. Um, what can I get you to drink as you're looking over the menu? So here you are with the menu at the restaurant, this, all these wonderful dishes that you're trying to decide what you're going to eat. And already you're salivating in your mouth and your stomach is already producing hydrogen and chloride that are coming together and forming hydrochloric acid and you're secreting pepsinogen and you're getting ready for this meal that you know is about to happen and then Jean, the, the waiter, brings you and then you say, oh, I'll just have water with lemon or, or just water and he brings you ice water or water and um, you start drinking. And so what does the water do to the pH of the stomach that's already getting very acidic? Water is the great neutralizer. Water will take an alkaline burning like lye and it'll move it this way. And water takes a strong acid and it moves it this way and it tries to bring it back to seven, back to balance. So before you even got your food, you've already started to sabotage your stomach by raising the pH closer and closer to seven. So what would be the, a more ideal thing to do when you're eating at a restaurant? Do not drink, or you could drink very little. You can wet your palate if, if you're really dry. If I drink water, which I will get at a restaurant, I'll drink maybe this much, like just a sip here and there. Sip, a sip's not gonna kill anything. But 
if you're emptying your glass, and then Jean comes back and says, oh, let's see, let me refresh your glass. And he fills you up again, and you drink it again, and you're drinking 8, 12, 14, 16 ounces of water when you eat. I guarantee you, you're moving your pH, your stomach above five into this. And you just sabotage the digestion of the fish, steak, or chicken that you just ordered that's going to be coming shortly. So, again, the, the question I ask people often is, why do we eat? Do we eat to digest, to get nourishment, or we eat just for the pleasure of eating? So, all right, so we got all that. So. <clears throat> just play for me. Yeah, so let's not nix our protons and uh, put out the fire in our stomach. Let's allow our stomach to be. But what is the reason why people take these drugs? Uh, for, because the number one condition related to the stomach that we get in this country is. Good. Gastro, meaning stomach, esophageal, meaning food pipe, gastroesophageal reflux, disease, not really a disease, it's more of a condition, and that is when the sphincter muscle at the end of the stomach, which is where the end of your esophagus actually thickens, the muscular coat thickens and functions as the sphincter, where the sphincters shut things like this, and they close them down. The, the cardiac sphincter at the top of the stomach, its function is to shut this down tight, and we also have a sphincter down here, the pyloric sphincter, so that when the stomach's churning and digesting, which it does churn and mix things up, it keeps it from, the, the sphincters keep the food from leaking out in either direction. So the most common cause of GERD is hiatal hernia, those of you, I'm going to write this down. I see every type of spelling when people come in and say, I have a hiatal hernia. It looks like hyena hernia. I see like this. And that's okay. That's fine. I've heard everything. It's kind of funny. But um, hiatal means hole. And you have three holes in your diaphragm. And these holes are for the three tubes that go through your diaphragmatic muscle, okay, which is like separate your heart and lungs from your small intestine. But a hiatal hernia is when this upper hole of the stomach called the fundus gets pushed up into that hole like this and it crimps the esophagus and irritates that valve and that valve opens slightly so that when your stomach's churning, the acid is spilling back up and into your esophagus, causing burning. So. Stomach acid is not a bad thing when it's in the stomach. It's a bad thing when it's in your esophagus. But the number one cause of GERD, according to Dr. Anthony Goodman, who I have on a, a video from the University of Montana Medical School, a, a Harvard-educated sur surgeon, says that the number one cause of hiatal hernia, I mean, of GERD is hiatal hernia. So what we do is just a very simple maneuver to slide the stomach back down as you exhale your diaphragm rises we slide the stomach down and it goes back to where it belongs and it releases the pressure on the cardiac sphincter and the sphincter shuts tight again and your acid stays in your stomach and those of you that experience this know that this works and that's why many people on any given day come in and say doc you have to pull my hernia down because you know when you when now after you've experienced the relief of this, you know what needs to be done when you start getting GERD again. Okay, so any questions on the stomach? Well, if you're asking them, I can't hear you anyway. So they can ask on the live um, stream. I have a question. All Is right, give me a question. People that take you were talking about the meds. What are the meds they take for that? And do they take those while they're eating? Do they take them? They usually take them, uh, well, sometimes people say, stomach, they'll say sometimes they'll take them in the morning and they'll take one a day and it seems like it blocks the stomach acid production all day long. And that's what it does, it blocks the stomach acid. It's also, it, they're, they're called proton pump inhibitors. So what are they inhibiting? They are inhibiting the secretion of the proton, of hydrogen. So they affect the cells of the stomach. So in the old days, when somebody had heartburn, grandma would say, get a little bit of baking soda and water and drink that, which was sodium bicarbonate. So when you mixed sodium bicarbonate to um, hydrochloric acid plus HCl, 
The hydrogen joined up here, they switch partners. This is positive and the bicarbonate is negative and this is positive and this is negative and they switch partners and they form sodium chloride, which is what? Table salt plus, now two hydrogens, H2O. Water. And you form salt in water from drinking a little bit of sodium bicarbonate. You know, and that would relieve the heartburn. That was actually like a more benign thing to do, like an eighth of a teaspoon of sodium bicarbonate baking soda and water versus taking a drug that paralyzes the cells lining the stomach so that it cannot secrete hydrogen into the stomach. So you're actually poisoning these cells that line this, this stomach membrane. And I think, I mean, long term, that's why you're seeing kidney problems and heart problems and other issues from taking a drug that's a little more aggressive than grandma's remedy of um, sodium bicarbonate uh, and, um, and, and the water. So I'm going to grab my little spray thingy here because this isn't erasing too good. Okay, you're ready. Okay. Good gosh. Okay, so actually I should liquid to grab me a paper towel. All right, so now we're gonna move on to the next phase of digestion. I think we're doing okay here, time-wise. Um, the, the next phase is small intestine function. Okay, and this is where the action is as far as, this is where absorption or digestion is finished and absorption takes place. So this is very critical that we understand how things work here and, and how we cannot how we cannot sabotage that function in the small intestine. So now we're just gonna make our stomach very small here. It's gonna be up here. Okay, and then when the stomach leaves, now we're gonna go bigger. You, you the stomach goes, what's called the first section of the small intestine is your duodenum. We had a teacher in splanchnology in chiropractic school. She always said, you're doing the enum. And everybody would go, you're the enum. She'd go, you're doing the enum. So, you know, so it's all like whatever you want to call it. But that's the first section of your small intestine. And what happens here is above here is our liver. And actually inside the loop of the duodenum is your pancreas but for the sake of di uh, di diagramming we're going to say your pancreas we're going to put it up here okay and the two of them have their ducts the pancreatic duct and the hepatic duct liver duct they come down and they join and form the common bowel duct Salmon bowel duct. CBD looks like what? CBD oil, but it's not it. Your common bowel duct. Okay. And it opens or empties. There's another little sphincter muscle here that shuts tight in the middle of your uh, duodenal loop. So these two organs are making enzymes throughout the day that are stored in a little organ that we call the what? Class. If you said gallbladder, you get 100%. The enzymes come down the tube, they, they hit that sphincter, they back up into the, and stored into the gallbladder. So you think about, we have two bladders in our body, a urinary bladder down here that collects urine from the kidneys until it's appropriate to eliminate it or evacuate it. That's the function of bladder. Store something, and then when it's appropriate, it eliminates it. In the case of your gallbladder, the gallbladder fills up with your enzymes, and when the food now coming out of the stomach leaves and goes around the duodenal loop and it starts to come in through here, the nervous system is alerted that here comes the food through your vagus nerve and it goes through the nerve endings in your intestine back up into your spinal cord, into your, actually your vagus nerve, which comes from the top of your neck, the brain stem, and it sends an impulse over here to the gallbladder, and it says, here comes the food, it's time to 
evacuate or empty. So as the food comes around the bend, the bowel starts to get secreted into the food as it makes this loop through here. Okay, so now we have uh, the food that's now mixed with all the enzymes coming here from the gallbladder from this point on. And the, the enzymes from your pancreas, lipase, amylase, protease, lipase is for lipids or fats, amylase is for starch and carbohydrates, and there's some other ones, and protease or protein digesting. Anything with an ACE, ASC at the end means enzyme, and proteases, and so these enzymes are going to complete the digestion of those medium-sized molecules and break them up into the smallest particles, amino acids, simple sugars, and fatty acids, which will then be absorbed in the next um, portion of the small intestine called the jejunum. Kind of a weird name. Jejunum. Jejunum. No, the jejunum. You never had that issue. But, okay, so that will happen later. The liver's job is among other things, it secretes bowel salts and cholesterol. The liver is what makes our cholesterol. 95% of your cholesterol is made in your liver. So the body's making this fatty substance called cholesterol because it wants to make sure that by the time you're 40 or 50, your arteries are all plugged up with plaque and you have a massive heart attack or a stroke. Correct? Yeah. Uh, no, if you said correct, go to the back of the class. <laughs> now you're watching too much television and it's time to get your mind right when it comes to cholesterol. Your body makes cholesterol, choline meaning liver, uh, and sterile meaning fat. So liver fat is made because what do we make from liver fat or cholesterol? How about steroids? Steroids have to be made from something, and it seems like sterol would be a good thing to make steroids from. So all your steroids, you women, estrogen, progesterone, men, testosterone, of course we both, both sexes have both, um, your androgens, all, all your adrenal, cortisone, cortisol, uh, DHEA, pregnenolone, uh, all your uh, hormones in your body actually come from, if you look at a hormone chart, it'll start with cholesterol, and then it goes down here, and it goes and makes all the other hormones. So we make cholesterol, number one, because we need to make our hormones from it. Second, we need to wrap our nerves around a fatty sheet made from cholesterol. So 60% of your brain is cholesterol, is, is fat, which comes again, it's produced by the body to uh, protect the brain and wrap the brain in it and speed up the transmission of nerve impulses. One of the side effects of people taking statin drugs long term would be a, a brain decline or the loss of the fat in the brain and a hardening of the brain matter which is multiple sclerosis. Sclerosis is a hardening of something that should be soft and spongy and gooey and fatty. So sclerosis, a hardening of the brain leads to diminished ability to transmit nerve impulses and what happens to a person neurologically. They start to slow down, they can't think straight, can't find their thoughts, their words, they get Parkinson's, MS, Alzheimer's, all these breakdown of brain tissues partly, I believe, are due to the boogeyman that we've created cholesterol to be, unfortunately. The only bad cholesterol, by the way, is oxidized cholesterol. And one of the things that contributes to oxidized cholesterol is the consumption of trans fatty acids, bad fats, and sugar. So the two things, if you want to ruin the cholesterol in your body, eat lots of sugar and eat lots of packaged carbohydrate things with palm oil, safflower oil, peanut oil, and all the hydrogenated oils that they put in anything that comes out of a box or a package. All right, so. The function of bowel salts is to take big molecules of fat and break them up into bunches of little molecules so that your enzymes have a greater surface area to act upon and to break down and digest uh, these fatty molecules. 
So bowel salts are very important. They also detoxify the colon, they cleanse your colon, and they stimulate peristalsis, which is they stimulate bowel movements. Okay, so that when people have, excuse me, gallbladder issues and they're not getting a good release of bowel salts, one of the problems that results from that is constipation. And over the years when we give people bowel salts, they'll often comment, oh, man, I'm moving my bowels a whole lot better. That's great. Well, okay, so that's one of the other functions of bowel salts. So what happens when people don't have their gallbladders anymore? Okay, you're kind of jumping ahead. Okay, but that's okay. The question was, what happens when people don't have their gallbladder? Well, let's see if you can put it together yourself. Okay, well, a few things here. We're back to, let's go back to the stomach acid, first of all, the hydrochloric acid. One of its other functions, or two of its other functions are, if you look back to Dr. Guyton here in Guyton's physiology, he will say that the secretion of pancreatic enzymes is stimulated by hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So one of the other functions of hydrochloric acid is to stimulate the pancreas to secrete. And it also says the hydrochloric acid coming through here, the acid content of the chyme, C-H-Y-M-E, which is the food leaving the stomach, uh, the hydrochloric acid in the chyme stimulates the gallbladder to contract and to secrete its enzymes and the pancreatic enzymes and bowel salts into the duodenal loop. So if we neutralize and we don't have this, one of the other detriments of not having hydrochloric acid in our body is we get a poor stimulation of the gallbladder and pancreas to secrete their enzymes and to secrete when the food comes around here, okay? So another important function of hydrochloric acid to cause stimulation of enzyme release, okay? But, so here's what happens. The gallbladder, I'm gonna, we'll make it enlarge it here. The gallbladder has another very unique function, and I don't wanna to get too far into the weeds here, but your gallbladder uh, is like a backup mechanism for the kidneys that if your body needs minerals, primarily sodium, which is Na, is our chemical symbol for sodium. If your body needs sodium, which is the number one mineral in, in bile, B-I-L-E, is the liquid that's contained in the gallbladder, but the number one, the highest concentration of minerals in the bile is sodium. Sodium, and this is going to be it for another class coming up in the future where we're going to talk about the importance of alkalinity and how you can test your body that you have adequate alkaline minerals uh, in, in your system. And the most important of that is sodium. That the gallbladder has the ability to steal sodium if you don't have adequate amounts of it in your bloodstream. And the purpose in your blood is to keep balance the pH of the blood and keep the pH of the blood slightly alkaline. So if, this is like back to the principle of if you don't eat right, your body's gonna eat you. So if you don't take in all the minerals and vitamins and things that you need to nourish your body, your body has to go for an alternative source to supply itself. And so unfortunately what it does is starts breaking down its own tissue. But one of the backup mechanisms, because keeping the blood pH at 7.40, slightly alkaline, is mandatory for life and for health I mean, life, if, you, if this varies by 0 0.05, uh, half of, uh, hundred, five one hundredths of a percent, this, you will die. You don't have the option of getting sick. You just go right to death. So your body, being that it's designed to keep you alive, whether you cooperate or not, it's going to uh, have to balance this blood pH at all, all costs. So you have the ability to steal sodium from the gallbladder back into the bloodstream, okay? But unfortunately, sodium is the main constituent of the bowel salts, and when you do that, you diminish the bowel salts in the, in the gallbladder, and the cholesterol, which is kept in solution or kept in a liquid form, starts to precipitate. And when cholesterol starts to precipitate, that means it hardens, and what does that ultimately lead to the formation of? gallstones, you start forming 
first sludge, many of you have been told, oh, you got sludge in your gallbladder, and then ultimately the sludge starts to get thicker and thicker and it forms sand, and then the little sandy particles start to coalesce and form together, and next thing you know, you got a little bag of stones in there, uh, which will be an excuse that they'll use to take out your gallbladder. So when, when it gets sludgy and full of stones, you don't get a good release of enzymes into the small intestine, and so you start to get symptoms. And because the pH of the bowel happens to be 8.6, it's very alkaline, it neutralizes from this point on, the pH of your intestinal tract switches from acid to alkaline. Now it's supposed to be alkaline. And because it's supposed to be alkaline here, you have a very thin coat of mucus cells that line the small intestine. Up here, it's very thick because it's protecting you from acidity. But once you get past this duodenal loop, the acid, I mean, the mucus the lining of the stomach gets thinner, just enough to slide the food through because it's supposed to be alkaline. Okay. So now what happens um, when you steal minerals from the gallbladder, you change the pH of the gallbladder from 8.6, which is normal, and the physiology books will say that the range of gallbladder uh, pH can run from 4.0 to 8.6. This is never normal. This is normal. This becomes the new normal when your gallbladder starts stealing sodium from this. And so what happens? This pH is acidic, and when the food comes around the bend here and the gallbladder empties, instead of giving a nice refreshing bath of 8.6 alkalinity, you get a bath of acid, and now you have a, a duodenum that's not protected, as well protected from acid as the stomach in the first section of the duodenum was, so people start to get burning. And this is when they get duodenal ulcers, and they'll get a lot of pain after eating, like an hour or so after eating, once the food leaves the stomach, and comes into here and the gallbladder secretes, instead of getting the, the cool, refreshing, uh, uh, release of alkaline enzymes, you're getting this dumping of acid and it causes burning and pain. So then you go in and they say, oh, your gallbladder's inflamed and oh, your gallbladder's not functioning and oh, you have 20% function or 10% or 15% function, we're gonna have to take it out. And actually, I was very proud of a young lady yesterday that came in, that she had a friend that they were gonna take, they were gonna take out her gallbladder because they said she only had 20% function. And one of the graduates here of Bovard Chiropractic told her friend, well, isn't 20% better than 0%? Dr. Bovard says 20% is guy who I say, would you rather have $20 in your wallet or zero? If I say, oh, you only have $20 in your wallet. Here, let me relieve you of that. And now you have zero. Does that feel better? No, I'd rather have 20% and then learn how to make it function better than have 0% and have zero function. Because now we'll go back to our question, what happens, I should use black, I see. What happens when the gallbladder is gone? Okay, when the gallbladder is gone, the food still leaves the stomach, comes around the duodenal loop, the nervous system stimulated, time to empty, and what do we get? Absolutely nothing. There's nothing to cause an emptying. There's no bladder. If I took out your urinary bladder, you're gonna to have to wear a bag. You're, otherwise, you're gonna be trickling all day long. And that's what happens with all the gallbladder. You're getting enzymes that are being produced, and they just, they have nowhere to go to be stored, so they're literally leaking, and just think of a leaky faucet, all day long leaking, 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 when there's no food in the stomach to digest, I mean, in the duodenum to digest. So, what happens when the gallbladder is gone? Nothing. The food comes around the bin, and it's waiting for the enzymes to come, and they don't come. So what happens to the food? It goes into the jejunum, the next section of the small intestine, undigested, and what does your body do? 75% of your immune system is in your, in your intestinal tract, because that's one of the main routes that we bring foreign matter into our body, Either we breathe it in or we ingest it. And if we ingest it, and there's bacteria, we have to have a way of killing things 
that don't belong there. So when your immune system then comes in contact with undigested food, it treats it as though it were a foreign pathogen, like a bacteria or a virus or something. And it says, what is this stuff? Doesn't belong here, let's get rid of it. And so instead of absorbing in, your intestinal tract flushes like a submarine, it blows the ballast tanks, it flushes water into, and it hurries up and it, and it pushes that stuff out of there. And that's what diarrhea is in many instances. It's the body getting rid of undigested matter that it doesn't belong there. And so it wants to eliminate it. So then what happens? What's the next consequence of when you don't digest your food? You don't break down protein, and protein's needed to rebuild every organ and tissue in your body. All your enzymes are made from protein, so everything is made from protein. So if we can become protein deficient, we're also going to become fat deficient. We're not going to be break, able to break down our fats and get our fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin D, which from our science-based nutritional testing, we're seeing almost, what, nine, 95% of the people are coming in with extremely low vitamin D levels. And I, I don't think that's all from being wintertime because we saw this in the summertime and in the, in the uh, fall, people that are outside gardening and playing sports and whatever, were still coming in with very low vitamin D. And that's because we don't get it all from the sun. We also get it from our food and, and from digesting oils and fats. And if we can't digest fat, we're gonna be deficient in our fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and vitamin K which is important for clotting of your blood. So we'll be protein deficient, fat deficient, carbohydrate kind of, because people then, with, especially when they lose their gallbladder, they find that the foods that they can digest are usually carbs because it's not as dependent on stomach acid and not as dependent on bowel salt function. And so you can eat sweets and get sugar. And so what do you get from eating sweets and carbs all the time and then not getting good protein and fat. Well, sugar goes to fat, you end up getting fat. And then you also get diabetes. And about 10 years after gallbladder removal, most people are either pre-diabetic or already in early stages of diabetes because of the gravitation towards uh, eating uh, more sugars and carbs and an inability to eat fat and protein without getting gassed up. Remember the old commercial with the bloaters? You know, and that was again for one of the uh, acid blocker things, which was kind of really, I think, uh, deceptive advertising because the bloaters, you know, they eat and they were bloating. And so they're all walking around like this, with their bellies out like this. And then they take the enzymes or, or whatever the antacid that they took and it's like, ah, oh, they're relieved from the gas. But actually the gas is coming because your food isn't digesting, it's rotting. Like the dead deer on the side of the road with the belly stick out here, it's filling up full of gas from fermentation and putrefaction, two alternative processes to digestion, okay, which we want to avoid. All right. So when the gallbladder is gone, the food leaves the stomach, the food comes around here and it's waiting for its enzymes and the enzymes don't come and then what? We have problems. So what's the solution? What is the compensation solution for somebody that's lost their gallbladder? Some of you that have come to the office, I've been through this with you. This will be a review and for other ones that think about it. What are you gonna do if you don't have a gallbladder to, to mix and complete the digestion of protein here? Well, what I say is what used to happen here we're going to have to make happen here, okay? That's the only way you can compensate for this. You're not going to be able to inject bile salts and pancreatic enzymes into the duodenum down here. But if we can catch them while they're still, while the food is still in the stomach, okay? Your food, if you eat a protein meal, is going to be in your stomach, guidance says, from two to three hours until the protein is adequately broken down to where it's able to be released to the next phase. But we need our stomach to be acidic, and we said <coughs> that these enzymes from the pancreas and liver are alkaline, so we really don't want to dump them into the stomach when the stomach needs to be acidic. 
So we let the stomach do its job, I'd say for at least an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. That gives you adequate time to activate your pepsin and start digesting your protein in your stomach. And then at that point, you're gonna to have to drop in to the stomach to mix here before the food leaves a bowel salt tablet, which is uh, from the liver, bowel salts, and from standard process, that's called Colacol. Standard process and pancreatic enzymes. And so what we typically use for this is either Multizyme or Lactins, or for those that are uh, vegetarian, we have Enzacor. Enzacor, which is a vegetarian form of Multizyme, so there's no animal products in it. And you're gonna to wanna to do, and you're gonna to have to play with this. You're gonna start, like I said, depending on how big of a protein or fatty meal you eat, you might wanna go, if it's more fat, maybe two, two bowel salt tablets, but it maybe, I say starting out, try one of this and one of this, and then see how you do. And your trigger could be uh, if you gas up, if you get very gassy after eating, or if you just feel like your digestion, maybe your stool's too soft and runny, then you might wanna increase the amount of either bowel salts or, or enzymes that you take uh, 45 minutes to an hour after you eat. Is this a pain to do for the rest of your life? Yeah, it's a pain to do for the rest of your life. But what is your option? Pretend that it doesn't matter. People do this. Some will come and do this for a while. Like, oh, I just got tired of doing that. Got tired of watching my clock, setting a thing on my phone. I just figured out, oh, whatever. Well, okay, if you do that, then you accept the reality that you're not gonna digest your food. So whatever you eat, uh, maybe at that point, just accept the fact that you're eating for the pleasure of eating and not for the purpose of bringing in nutrients to assimilate and to nourish your body. Because you are not going to nourish your body, you're gonna be protein deficient, and you're gonna be fat deficient, and you're gonna be vitamin deficient, and you're gonna be mineral deficient for the rest of your life. So that's the disservice that a surgeon does for you when they take out your gallbladder and they say, you can go home and eat whatever you want. Hey, go have a pizza on the way home. You can, yeah, you can eat anything. You can't digest anything. That's the downside of that. Again, except sugar. So that's what happens when you lose your gallbladder. All right, so that covers stomach. Liz, can you get another yeah. water thing here? Um, that covers stomach and uh, intestine, pancreas, liver, um, gallbladder function, and that leads us to the last, the last part of our digestive system. And this one's easy, this will be quick. Can you give me more than a little time? Oh, okay. All right. Um, the last part of our digestive system, which is Class? Large intestine. Large intestine, or commonly known colon. as the colon. So we have the colon, the large intestine, large intestine. And that's very simple. So the large intestine comes in and to an area called the cecum. So the large intestine, those are called hostra. So it goes like this, like this, like this. And the large intestine is like an upside down horseshoe or a horseshoe, okay? And then your appendix kind of hangs down here by off the cecum. That, you know, that useless organ that God put there for no purpose. All right, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, many of you come in and I will tell you you have an ileocecal valve problem. This is another valve, which is really valves in your digestive tract or just thickening of the muscular wall of the tube. So we always describe our digestive system as a tube within a tube, starting from the mouth and ending with the anal sphincter. It's just a tube, but what makes the different compartments are sphincters, the areas that constrict and then create a specialized area of that tube. So the stomach's your first specialized area, then your small intestine, 
and you have a sphincter muscle here, and you actually have another one on the other side between this and the sigmoid colon, and that's called the valve of Houston, valve of Houston, which we don't talk about too much. It doesn't create too many problems, unlike the ileocecal valve. The last portion of your small intestine is called the ileum, and the first portion of your large intestine is called the cecum. Cecum in anatomy means a blind pouch or like a dead end street. This doesn't go anywhere. This is start here. And it's kind of like the trap underneath your sink in your kitchen or your bathroom. Okay, so things get, what happens in the trap? Things get trapped there. And if you don't take care of your, or your sinks in your house, they get plugged up and eventually you're not getting good drainage. And, and um, we have to like, take them apart and then clean them out and then put them back together. Okay, so that's what happens in your cecum. Uh, and because things tend to uh, accumulate here, because this has to go up against gravity, you'll start to get accumulations of fecal matter down there in the cecum. And when you're getting fecal matter, what do you get? You get bacteria, you get all kind of bad stuff. So you need to have a way of disinfecting or keeping this area clean. And that's the purpose of this little tonsil called the appendix. It is a lymphoid organ, almost exactly like your tonsils. And its function is to uh, produce white blood cells and to keep the cecal area clean and disinfected. So when they say we don't need that, again, just like your gallbladder and all the other things we can live about, and we take that out, now you don't have a mechanism to keep your sequel area clean in your colon. And could, could that lead to problems? Yes, that could lead to many types of problems uh, in, in your large intestine. So the ileocecal valve purpose is to keep, just like we have GERD, where things go back up into the esophagus, the function of the ileocecal valve is to open and close and let the at this point, the matter is pretty much uh, fecal matter. Go into here, but we want to prevent a backflow into the small intestine. And we say we don't want to get the garbage back into the kitchen, all right, and serve it back up for dinner. Not good. So you want the garbage to be taken out and get out. And if you have an open ileocecal valve, you'll get a backflow of fecal material into your small intestine. And one of the biggest symptoms of that, for me, when I was younger, it was headaches, horrific headaches. You're gonna get a toxic overload into your body and you can get very, very bad headaches from an open ileocecal valve. So again, there's a procedure we use to release the spasm in the valve, and that's where you put pressure on it, <coughs> then you can put a pull pack on it, whatever, and you wanna get that valve to close tight so that the fecal matter then moves up and over and out. And what's the main function of our colon now? The main function of our colon is to reabsorb water, H2O plus salt. And this is where we reclaim our water and reclaim our salt. And so we started with solid food and then we liquefied it, we said to, so we could absorb it like a juicer. And then the last step of the process is to reabsorb the water, to conserve the water in our body and to make it a solid again, a semi-solid anyway, to where we could then defecate and eliminate the fecal matter and get it out of our body. So we want to reabsorb water here and, and salt and then let every, the rest of it pass out. And so that's the main function of the colon. But by its unique anatomical design with these little hostra, these little indentations, things can tend to accumulate in here and your colon can start to get a buildup of toxic matter, which is then reabsorbed into your bloodstream and seeded out throughout the whole body. So that's where it's important to consume you know, adequate amounts of fiber, because fiber is in, undigestible, and it, it serves to like, like the little soft scrub guys to go in there and scrub the walls of your colon to clean it out so that you can get that fecal matter completely out of, of your tube. So this morning after, after I worked out, I do on a regular basis, a couple times a week, I'll do a combination uh, colon cleanse that we use uh, called, it used to be 7779, it's now I hear seven and nine, and it's a mixture of bentonite, which is clay, clay water, 
and psyllium seed, finely ground fiber, indigestible fiber, that has the ability of clay. Women, you know what clay does when you put a facial on. Clay has the ability to pull impurities out. So as the clay water goes through with the psyllium seed, it scrubs this lining, but it also draws impurities back into the uh, fecal matter so that it's removed from your body. So this is a way you keep your pipes clean and uh, keep the buildup of toxic matter out of your body. So that's the function of colon. So uh, the other uh, thing here is we have bacteria in our colon and bacteria serve, they actually make vitamin K. Bacteria do make, uh, synthesize some of the vitamins for us and it's important, just like a septic system, you wanna have good bacteria in your colon and that's the idea of taking probiotics. Prebiotics, probiotics is to keep adequate bacteria in your gut, very important. So when you've been on a course of antibiotics, uh, you're gonna wipe out the good bacteria in your gut and most people know that they have to then follow that up with taking a probiotic and, uh, or maybe something first we, we call it weed and feed, kill the bad bacteria and then feed the good bacteria. Things like garlic, oregano uh, are good um, to kill off the bad. Gut flora complex from Meta Herbs is a couple different types of oregano oil. Inner defense from Young Living, very good. Oregano oil, kill the bad stuff and then follow that with, if you're a Young Living person, Life 9 to um, put the good bacteria back in. We use either lactins or lactic acid yeast or Zymex, and there's several, pro-symbiotic, there's several standard processor meta herbs products that also restore the, the gut flora. So that pretty much wraps it up. I mean, that gives us, we went through from the mouth to the uh, colon, large intestine, and I think uh, that should give you a little better understanding of how your digestive system works. I think our next workshop I think we're going to do a short one on the minerals, on the mineral alkalinity. I think we're going to do a little demo. We'll get a few people in here and we'll do the lemon test and we'll show you how important it is to take adequate minerals into your body to first digest the food that you're eating and second to um, make sure that your mineral levels are good so we keep our blood pH balanced, keep ourselves alive and not force our body to eat us because we're not eating right. So with that, I'm gonna leave you with that pleasant thought. Until next time, this is Dr. John from Woher Chiropractic and Woher Wellness Systems wishing you good health and a happy day.